can anyone heal me and see the slides just fine? Yes. All right. Thank you. So I guess with that, I guess we I will start the workshop right now. So first, so first of all, I would like to thank you all to attending. And my name is Angus, and I'm going to show you how you all of you can build a custom PC. So, so I am a rising 10th grade a sophomore that's going to start my next year of high school in a couple of days. And last year, I decided to build my very own PC. And, and, I, and it turned out to be a great success. And I've been using that PC to do my homework, play games, write programs. And as of right now, using it to present this workshop to all of you. So this is what we're going to go over today is that we're first going to start by introducing what the custom PC is. Then I'm going to talk about what each part does. Then after we understand that, then we can go into learning how to choose our parts and then how to assemble them. Then once we have that done, we're going to install all our software. And lastly, we, I'm going to teach you what to do in case there was a problem with your PC and how to troubleshoot it and how to maintain your computer. And lastly, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end where anyone can ask me a question. So now we're going to start by introducing what a custom PC is. And a custom PC in its finished state is exactly like a regular, like any other PC. It's th there's no difference. The only difference is is that instead of buying, instead of the PC coming in one piece, a custom PC is actually bought in individual parts, and it is assembled to form the PC. In which here you can see that these are all the computer parts that are being used to assemble this PC. But However, we also need to understand that what actually were those parts I just showed you at the very beginning. So the, there are eight parts that we're going to be talking about. And these eight parts are the parts that you must have in order to build a PC. These eight parts are called the CPU, the CPU cooler, the RAM, the disk storage, the video card, the motherboard, the power supply, and the case. Now, you don't, now, don't worry if you don't understand any or one of these points. In fact, many people don't. So instead, what, we're, what we can do is that in this next section, which we're going to go into, I'm going to explain what each point does so I can help you get, so you can help get a better understanding. So I'm first going to talk about the CPU known as the central processing unit. Right here on the screen, you can see two examples of what the CPU looks like. And the CPU's job for the computer is to perform instructions. And instructions can be anything like, for example, a, a, cal a math calculation. That would be a, one example of an instruction. Uh, and so now this concept is fairly simple, but what's more complicated is often the terms used to describe a CPU. But here, this is a listing on amazon.com and it's the top four results for searching when you search up a CPU. And you can see here that there are a lot of terms used to describe how each of these CPUs are different. For example, if we look here, processor count, does that mean that these CPUs come in multiple pieces? Well, we, well, let's we can talk. Let's talk about that. So, the most common terminology when used to describing a CPU that is also shown here is called the processor count or a core. A uh, processor count is just simply a uh, one processing unit on the CPU, and a processing unit is different from the actual CPU because if we go back here, this is an example of one CPU and these CPUs actually have multiple processing units, but, but it's all on one singular chip. So even a CPU with multiple processing units 
will will come will always come in one chip most of the time. But what do these processing units do? Is the is another great question. So, a good ana analogy for these processing units works like this: in which that suppose you are cleaning your room, in which that you have a lot of things, multiple tasks that need to be done. You, you need to tidy your bed, pick up all some clothes on the floor, and then organize your closet. Well, if you only had one person cleaning your room at the same time, you wouldn't be able to clean to make your bed and clean up your closet at the same time. But if you had two people, then you actually can clean your closet and make your bed at the same time. And this is the concept of multiple processor, uni processor units, where, where they can work together to run different tasks in parallel. And, and the effect on this is that if there are multiple, multiple tasks being run, then suddenly all those tasks become a lot faster. Like, like how it would be a lot faster to clean up your room with two with two people instead of one. So, so, and then the next thing I'm going to talk about is the CPU speed in which the CPU speed is also shown on this Amazon listing. And it's represented in gigahertz, also known as GHZ. The CPU speed shows how fast the CPU can perform instructions in which that a higher number is better. In which, for example, if we were to assume that the CPU on the first listing from the top and the CPU on the second listing from the top were the exact same, except for the CPU speed. Oh, excuse me. Then the then the 4.4 gigahertz CPU would be faster because it can perform calculations faster than the 4.2 gigahertz CPU. Now, what's important is that. These two terms are not, are not indicative of the CPU's performance. For example, is that a lot of times CPU manufacturers can make the CPUs faster without changing stuff that is represented in the in the info or, or specifications document. However, these two terms are quite important when judging the overall performance of a CPU and they are a good baseline. So the CPU contains a lot of circuits in it and all those circuits can produce a lot of heat to the point where it can damage the CPU. So to prevent this, we are going to, next, we're going to be talking about the CPU cooler, which is a part that helps us cool down the CPU so it doesn't overheat. Now, one major thing that is different from most of the parts we're going to talk about today is that the CPU cooler is actually commonly included with the CPU as well. For example, if we look at the example on the bottom, we can see here how this CPU actually is bundled with a cooler that's ready for you to use. And we call this a stock cooler when a cooler is, is packaged along with the CPU. Then, however, what's also important to note is that there are some instances where the CPU will not come with a cooler and it will ask you to buy a cooler from a third party. And this is called an aftermarket cooler. Now, regardless of if the cooler came with your CPU or not, there are three different types of, of CPU coolers. The first type of cooler and the most traditional is the air cooler. The air cooler is, works by circulating cold air around your CPU in order to take off heat. It's, it's a pretty simple design and, if, and it's also the cheapest. If you get a stock cooler, for example, almost all stock coolers are going to be an air cooler. Now, now the newer now the newer type of air of cooling is known as the closed water loop or the AIO. The AI the AIO has one fundamental difference from the air cooler 
and that is that it actually instead of circulating air around the CPU, it circulates water around the CPU. In which that here you can see that there is a radiator attached to fans, and in that radiator, water is being circulated around this hose to the CPU and back. And the advantages of this approach compared to air coolers is that is that it, it can sometimes produce less noise and often provides a greater cooling capacity. Its main drawback, however, is that it is more expensive than the air cooler. Lastly, the last type of air the cooler that I'm going to talk about is the open water loop. And here you can see that even though these are full systems, the open water loop is it works by actually it arrives in different points such as tubing and like reservoir and things like that. And it is actually assembled together instead of the AIO where you can see it's all in one piece. The open water loops primary difference is that it can go through all the way across the system and, and it has to be assembled by yourself. Now, and the and this type of approach provides the greatest cooling capacity, but compared to the AIO and the air cooler. And also, it also provides a very, a very good opportunity for you to make your computer look nice. For example, in these two examples, these people have actually dyed their water to make it look nicer. The main drawback here, however, is that the open water loop is very expensive compared to the AIO and air cooler sometimes more than $200. And also, and also there's a hype, there is this type of cooling has the highest possibility of a leak happening in which that if a leak happens and water gets across your electronic components, then it is very likely that that electronic components will be damaged, which is a huge, which, is, which can be quite costly to repair. So the next type of part we're going to talk about is the RAM, also known as the random access memory. The purpose of the RAM is to provide a place where applications can store data they need quickly. And for example, let's say that if you're at school and you needed to, and you had a daily planner that you needed to write and check very often, it would be it would save you a lot of time if that daily planner was positioned right in front of you, then say the opposite side of the room where you would have to go and walk all the way and walk back in order to get it. This is, this is an example with, about why RAM is so important and how it can make programs a lot faster. Now, here the RAM also has a lot of vocabulary like the CPU that's also important for us to understand. The main difference that, you, that you'll see here is that unlike in the CPU where it's only one point, random access memory commonly comes in multiple points or multiple sticks as they're referred to. In which you can see here all of these, all of these listings on Amazon show that the see that the RAM comes in multiple sticks rather than a singular stick. Now, now how you can tell if how many sticks the RAM comes into is as, as you can see, the second example, it only shows one stick. However, if we look closely, we can see that it actually comes in two sticks. And how we can find this out is that is that next to the overall size of the RAM, you'll see some, uh, something in parentheses, which often states a number of times X amount of storage. Now, what this refers to is that the first number refers to how many sticks the package comes with. And then the next number then refers to how big the storage is for one stick of RAM. So that's how we're able to tell that this second listing, even though there's only one stick being displayed, if we look closely, we realize that this actually comes in two sticks and each stick has eight gigabytes. So the next thing that we're also gonna talk about about RAM is the speed of the RAM. And the speed of the RAM is measured in megahertz, which is abbreviated here as MHZ. The, um, 
the concept of this is a lot similar, is quite similar compared to the CPU speed where a higher number is faster. For example, a 3600 megahertz CPU RAM would be, uh, would be faster than a 3200 megahertz RAM. So now we're also going to get into another type of storage in which that I'll go back to our, our daily planet example I used for the RAM. So once you, so now let's say that you have a big pile of homework that needs to be turned in. It's already finished, so you won't need to touch, you won't need to access it until when it's time, when the due date arrives where you have to turn it in. Now, now this pile of homework is inconvenient and, and not practical to keep in front of your desk at all times. So what, so what can be done, for example, is to put all your homework into a separate container and put it some distance away from your working desk. And, and that container would be the equivalent of disk storage. And which at the concept with disk storage, instead of having a low amount of memory that can operate very quickly like RAM, a disk storage can, ha can house a lot more data compared to RAM, but is a lot slower. Now, there are three different types of disk storage that are still present, that are still used today. And they are the HDD, also known as the hard disk drive, the solid state drive, also known as the SSD, and a variation of the SSD called the NVMe SSD. So I'm first going to go over the hard disk drive or the HDD, which is on the leftmost slide, the leftmost slide. So the hard disk drive works by storing all the information into a metallic disk that spins around. And then the data is accessed and written to by a magnetic pin that, write, that writes the information as the disk spins. Now, which is, this is the most traditional method of disk storage, and it has been around the oldest compared to all of the three options we're talking about today. Now, you may notice that one big drawback of the hard disk drive is that it is a mechanical device. And a mechanical device can, is often vulnerable to some two things like faults or break or hard impacts. And, and they can also degrade over time. For example, a hard disk drive, there are multiple moving parts. And, and, when, and when there are multiple moving parts, that can, that can always be a risk factor in any product. So the next type of drive we're going to talk about is the SSD. And the SSD has several main advantages over the hard disk drive, which the most major being that it is no, it does not rely on a mechanical parts anymore. Rather, the SSD uses something called flash memory and flash memory works by just simply, you can simply access flash memory with a circuit, and which, which alleviates the problems caused by a mechanical disk with it being that it's more secure, it's more reliable, and it's also more faster since you don't have to wait for the disk to spin in order to access the information. Then, then the lastly, we're going to talk about a disk that's still considered an SSD, but is, but is a variation in which that's called an NVMe SSD. So NVMe SSDs are still considered SSDs, but its main difference in how it differs from a traditional SSD is that the NVMe SSD is a lot smaller than the SSD. For example, like in these photos, these SSDs are actually not fit to size, but in reality, the NVMe SSD can be as wide as a, as a quarter, whereas the SSD is, um, is usually 2.5 inches wide. So that, can, so that can be quite a big difference if you're looking for a small hard drive. The next part I'm going to talk about is the video card, which is also known as the GPU graphics card. 
So the basic role of the video card is to output a signal from your computer to your to your monitor or television, in which that once you're done installing your computer, you'll need to plug in your monitor to the video card directly. So that otherwise it won't you won't be able to see what's going on in your computer. However, that is only the most basic role of the video card. The video card, much like the CPU, the video card can also be used to perform, can, can be used to perform calculations that it, that it specifically excels at, in which that the video card excels at Bitcoin mining, for example, video rendering and, and, photo, and photo rendering. Those are a couple of examples where the video card can really make a huge performance difference in performance. The main thing I'm going to talk over today, however, is the way video cards can be implemented in which that there are two different types in which one is called the integrated graphics card and the other is called the dedicated graphics card. The dedicated graphics cards works by by it works as sim as like a lot like the CPU in which that it is a separate part that you just simply plug into your computer. The main advantage about dedicated graphics cards is that they can provide a lot more power compared to the integrated graphics card, which we'll talk about next. However, there are some issues with the dedicated graphics cards in which that the most the most common issue is that dedicated graphics cards are, can, are quite expensive compared to the integrated graphics cards. And there are some people that simply don't, don't do tasks that, are, that require the graphics cards that much. Maybe they're just doing homework or just surfing the web. Those are examples in which you don't need a good graphics card. So the solution for these use cases is called the integrated graphics card in which that instead of the graphics card being a separate part, the integrated graphics card is implemented inside of the CPU or the motherboard. Instead of having to buy attach a separate part, when you install a CPU with the integrated graphics card, then you can just simply use the CPU as an integrated graphics card. Now, now this is quite useful and can save a lot of money if you're not if if getting a dedicated graphics card is not is not for you, for like in the situations I described below before, but the main drawback of the integrated graphics card is mainly its power, in which that if you need performance, a dedicated graphics card is the way to go. The next part I'm going to talk about is the motherboard. And the motherboard simply serves as a hub for all of your PC parts. In which here, here I've, listed, I've pointed some examples about where each part can be attached to the motherboard, in which here is here you can see how the video card, the CPU, the RAM, and the power are all attached to the motherboard. However, this, the examples I gave you aren't exhaustive. And in fact, every single point depends on the motherboard in some way. So this really is like a hub where all of your points will communicate with each other. The motherboard is, cannot, is also responsible for providing IO points, which also known as input and output points. Input and output points are simply those that allow that allow an external device to be plugged into your computer. Oh, excuse me. Well, and if, well, if you, for example, if you attach a USB cable to your computer, then you will need an then you will need a corresponding USB port on your computer, which is an input and output port. The motherboard also has a role in determining which features your computer will support. There are some features such as Wi-Fi, for example, that can be offered directly with your motherboard, in which that most, is that most of the time, if your motherboard doesn't have built-in Wi-Fi, then you might have to resort to, to buying an antenna Wi-Fi so, and connect it through a USB port and to get Wi-Fi. 
But if your motherboard does have built-in Wi-Fi, then you can just simply not have to worry about buying a separate antenna. And, and then once you've installed the motherboard, you can use your Wi-Fi right away, right away. And Wi-Fi is not the only example in which that there are other examples the, the motherboard can provide, such as sound and Bluetooth. Next up, I'm going to talk about the power supply and the power supply simply is responsible for, for putting all the power to each of your ports. A lot of people make, make an assumption well, where you can just simply plug in your power, your, your computer to the wall and it will work. But what actually happens is that instead of plugging in the entire computer to the wall directly, you're plugging in the power supply to the wall and then from the power supply then you connect each port individually now the main now of now here there are some things that can be pretty self-explanatory such as the output wattage which as its name suggests tells you the amount of power the power supply will output however there are some that need to be explained further like the power supply design the power supply design is usually represented by fully modular, semi-modular, and non-modular. Now, what the term modular means in this case is referring to whether or not the output cables can be detached from the, from the power supply entirely. Here in, the, here in this example, we have an example of this power supply being a fully modular, in which as you can see here, you, the, all of the output cables are able to be detached from the power supply. In fact, there are actually no output cables connected to the power supply right now. And, and now going from that definition, then we can also find of you can also kind of figure out what semi-modular means in which that semi-modular refers to where only some of the cables can be outputted. Well, where, the, where some of the major ones such as maybe motherboard will be hardwired to the power supply, but, but the others can be taken out just like in this power supply. And lastly, we have the non-modular power supply. And as you may expect, it's a power supply where none of the output cables are able to be removed. The last part we're going to talk about today is the case. And the case can be fairly self-explanatory in which that the case is just a case to house all of your, your CPU components. But the only thing that's worth mentioning about the case that a lot of people miss is that the case also plays a very big role in your, in your computer's ventilation. In which you can see here, on the on all these cases in which you can see more clear on this one is that the case also is attached with with a couple of fans and these fans are sucking air in and out of your pc and this is important to help cool down your computer excuse me your it's your cpu isn't the only part that needs cooling all you don't all of your parts also can get quite hot, hot and they need proper air in order to cool it down. So those were all of the parts. Those were a basic overview of all the parts you need to build a computer. And so if, if anyone doesn't have any questions, which you can just post it in the chat, then, we, then we're going to go to the next section, which is about how to choose each of your parts. So when choosing your parts, there are three major things that, that you need to pay attention to. You firstly need to pay attention to your needs, which is how, which is which, which, how much performance do I need for my CPU? Since purchasing the most powerful components is, would, not, would often sometimes be a big waste if you really don't need that performance. And your budget is also quite important in which that a building a computer is also quite expensive. So you need to pay attention to, to how much money you're willing to spend and what should I spend my money on. And lastly, you need to pay attention to the compatibility between each of your points. 
not not all points will work together. If, for example, so you need to pay attention that that isn't the case in which that if you end up accidentally buying incompatible points, you may have to return the points that you yeah, bought and you have to buy a new one. So a general, so some general tips that I can give you when thinking about all three of these topics is that the first thing is that research is the most important part about choosing points. For example, like for example, the CPU, which I already discussed earlier, the performance of a CPU can't oftentimes can't be accurately described based on just looking at the information sheet in which that here, when it, so a lot of points like these will need to be, will need to be chosen based off of a methodology called real world testing. And what real world testing is that, is that well, people that have this that same exact CPU actually test their CPU with, with their computer working. And then they show, okay, this is the results I got when running this CPU. And this is the performance it gives me. Which, and oftentimes you will need to find reliable sources for real world testing in order to choose a lot of these points. And, and research is also important when, also when double checking claims by the manufacturer, in which that sometimes what a manufacturer says may not represent the full picture, or it may not even be true at all. For when when a CPU cooler says that it's, that it's guaranteed to cool down your CPU, no matter which situation, you need to do some research and check if that's actually really true. Because if not, then you can damage your, your CPU like that. The second tip I will give you is to is that I would recommend using a website to help you manage your points, which I'll give an example next slide about why that can be very useful. And lastly, when researching information about points, the manufacturer's page is the most reliable. Oftentimes, especially when checking compatibility, sites like Amazon or maybe or other reseller sites do not offer all the information you need, in which that, um, however, it is almost always certain that if you go to the manufacturer's page, it will provide all the information in which sites like Amazon or Newegg, which is another reseller website, it's not guaranteed. So I'm gonna give an example about an, online, about an online website you can use to manage your points. Obviously any, any website it has the same features we do, but this is the one I used when building my computer last year. The website is called pcportpicker.com. And the way it works is that it has a menu in which that you can choose each of your parts that you need. And which that not only does it list all the parts that you have, it can also automatically check for compatibility, give you an estimate about how much power it's using and it'll and it'll even and it'll even automatically select the lowest price from for the same exact part on on, on different websites. Yeah. And then and another thing I also like about this website is that even if you don't know which part you want, if you choose the select option, then it'll actually give you a list of all the parts that you can choose that are currently compatible with the with the parts you already chose. And that, and to me, that saves a lot of time because you don't, you no longer have to double check compatibility every single time you check a point. So this is a website I would strongly recommend you to using. But if you have any other examples or or any other website that does this, then that website will work fine as well. This is just one that I recommend you to use. So let's first go over your needs in which that the best way to go over your needs is if you have a previous computer you're still using, like a school laptop or, or, some, or a laptop that your parents gave you. So, so, what's, so what's helpful when doing that is that you should use that previous computer as a baseline and compare the parts it has and how well it's running. For example, if your school computer is oftentimes running out of disk space, but other than that, it's handling your needs quite fine. Like it, like it's running smooth. 
then then maybe when you buy a new computer you can there's no then you can just simply say there's no need to buy more upgrade your cpu since your parts are already running quite fine but you may need to upgrade your storage for example so that way you don't run out of the space again whereas in an opposite example well if your disk storage is fun is fine you've got lots of it but your your computer starting to run slow like maybe opening your browser is taking a long time then you can then then you can take a look and think and say okay my disk my hard disk doesn't need an upgrade but maybe i should consider looking at my cpu and whether a better cpu would help solve my problem but the one major problem but the one major thing that we haven't addressed yet is that when is that when we think oh, that, okay maybe a better cpu will help us but how do we how do we tell what cpu will, what cpu we need since if, since we know what cores and cpu speed are how but how do we know how they correlate to our needs and that's and that's a problem with every single part so right here in the next two slides i'm I'm show, I'm going to show you some examples of what of how of some general tips you can do for choosing your parts, in which that I will again give the advice. Well, you should always do research about about parts such as the CPU and the GPU, which those are two very known examples. Well, you have to rely on real world testing. But I think but I think that all the information I've listed here is is a quite a good baseline to where to start about how to choose your compute how to choose your parts for example choosing your best price to performance ratio in which in which that you can take a look at these unfortunately we're not going to describe these in detail as as it, as it takes quite a long time but if anyone wants it at the end of the meeting or in the chat i'll be happy to paste it in the chat for you one part that I feel like that should be discussed in detail, however, because it is especially important is the power supply. The power, the most important thing about the power supply is that you have to judge how much power your computer uses. Now, there are two main ways that this can be done. The first main way is that if you use an online website, for example, the PC port picker website I mentioned, then then it gives you an estimate of all of, of that the amount of power your CPU or your entire computer is using. And the second main way that you can also judge how much power your CPU your computer is using is by going to your video card manufacturer's website and looking at the recommendation for how much power your, your computer is going to use overall. And even though it's just one part, this recommendation is accurate because the video card uses the most power out of the entire computer. So once you have that, that estimation, then I would recommend you to add 100 watts to that estimation. For example, if PC Public says that your website's going to use 350 watts of power, then I would recommend you buying a power supply that can output up at least 450 watts of power. And this is just to make sure that you have like a buffer zone in case something happens or you need to remove or, or add any new points. Uh -huh. and, then the, and then the next thing I would recommend, which is relating to the power supply design is to aim for a semi-modular or modular power supply. Now this isn't as necessary as getting the enough wattage to your computer. For example, your computer isn't going to shut down just because you chose a non-modular power supply, but a semi-modular or modular power supply can will make assembly a lot easier. And, and oftentimes the difference between a non-modular power supply and a semi-modular power supply is, is not quite that, it's, it's not very expensive. So it's something that you can do even if you're on a tight budget. And then the last thing that's worth discussing and probably the most complicated of all is the efficiency of a power supply. In which that, in which that the amount of wattage that your power supply is going to output is not the same as the, as the amount of energy the power supply is using. 
for example, no power supply as of right now has a 100% efficiency. However, there will, however, there will, it's definitely true that, uh, that some power supplies are more efficient than others. Now, now here in the below table, you can see that the, that, that the 80 plus certification is a way for you to, to quickly tell how efficient the C, uh, power supply is. For example, a uh, power supply certified 80 plus will have 80% power supply efficiency at 20% of its load. And, and the more efficient your power supply is, then that means that less power is being drawn from your wall and that will result in you in a, in a cheaper power bill. But the, another important thing to mention is that more efficient power supplies are also more expensive. So, what is the so which power supply has the best price to performance ratio out of all out of all of the, the efficiency ratings? And as it stands right now, 80 plus gold has the best price to performance ratio in which that you'll get the most out of your power bill savings while spending the least amount of money on the power supply. So so getting 80 plus gold gold certification is something I would highly recommend as it is the best way to save money long term on your power bill while not spending too much money on the power supply itself. Next thing we're going to talk about is the budget and and the two main questions is mainly how you, you how can you make your money go the longest way? For example, what are considered worthwhile upgrades? And this question will have different answers to each use case. But, but the general guidelines, for example, go like this, in which that here, these are some upgrades that will help, that help, that will mostly help all, most situations, regardless of if you're doing different tasks. So some examples, so some examples include a reliable power supply in which while this doesn't affect how, um, oh, excuse me, this doesn't affect how your computer will run, it will affect the longevity of your computer. So getting a reliable power supply is quite important when making sure your computer can run just fine and prevents you from having to buy a new power supply. As for actual upgrades, the one, the first example I'll go over is, the, is getting an SSD for the OS and programs. In which that it's faster load, it's faster disk time compared to the hard disk drive, will make a big difference when loading when booting up your computer. As you, as if your OS is loaded in an SSD, it'll be a lot easier to access those and those files compared to a hard disk drive, where it will be slower. And then. The second upgrade that helps the most is the is up is getting a more powerful CPU. Thus, uh, the CPU can be used as almost a, as a benchmark, a baseline for how well your CPU, for how how well your computer performs. Simply because, oh, because almost all tasks on your computer will involve some will involve the CPU. And lastly. Getting a faster RAM can also make a big difference in in how fast programs load or or run. Now, of course, these are just uh, some general examples in which that here maybe if you're editing videos a lot, then 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 it would be worthwhile to get a big to get a big to like get a bigger graphics card. So so you can feel free to modify this list as based off your needs. But here were just some examples where, where, base, where it will help, where mostly helps anyone regardless of your use case scenario. Next thing we're going to talk about is compatibility. And compatibility is a straightforward but very important step in which that, you know, so the process of checking compatibility is to compare data between two parts and see if they match up. In which that if they don't match up, then we can conclude that the parts are not compatible, and 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 they and they, we need to get new parts. 
Now, some sites can check compatibility, such as the PC Port Pico. However, even PC Port Pico itself states that you should check yourself after you're done. If, however, I would still recommend using a site to check compatibility as, it, as instead of having to check parts constantly after choosing a part, you only have to check it once after you finish choosing all your parts. The way I recommend you going about checking your compatibility manually is to either go is to either go through a checklist or a video in which that in which that once you've made sure that something is compatible, then you can check it off and then later and then go to the next one. Um, and and also Another important note that you should be aware of when making this step is that you sh it's, a, it's important to be patient in which that there are a lot of things that you need to check. For example, there are sometimes in this case between the eight major parts, there are more than 30 compatibility checks that you'll need to do. So, so that's my advice for compatibility. Now if, none, now, if none of you had any questions about that, then, then we can start by talking about how to assemble your PC, in which that now we've had all parts, we've made sure that they're compatible and they fit our needs. Now we can begin assembling them and putting it into a finished product. Now I'll give a disclaimer, and this is important, is that this guide is a general guide which means that this guide will try to pertain to the, uh, the most common situations. And, and, this, and this works because a lot of parts are standardized in which, that, in which that if you plug in a USB port, then that same, then as long as a, a computer has, a, has the same USB port, then it will always work even with different, with different like cables or chargers. But there are some cases, instances where some parts are not are not standardized, so in which they will vary based off the part itself. And so it goes without saying that you should always check the instruction guide slash manual for each part whenever whenever you can to make sure that there isn't something you missed or there isn't something special about the part you bought that's not that's not in the general parts. So the things that you will need other than, than the parts that we talked about and other than accessories is that you'll need a flashlight in order to look, in order to make sure that we can see everything in the case as the case can get quite dark. We'll also need a screwdriver to unscrew some screws in which that the one, the size we'll need is a number two Phillips screwdriver and a number zero Phillips screwdriver if we're going to install an NVMe SSD. We're also going to need some Velcro strips to make to help us organize our cables. We will talk about that later. We're, and then we'll also need a place to hold any small parts or, or screws, like a magnetized tray or a bowl, in which that we don't want to be losing any small parts or screws, as then we won't be able to secure our parts fully. fully. And lastly, We'll need an anti-static wristband, and this can and this is optional. But if you live in an area with with a lot of static, then I highly recommend you get one. So before starting, you'll need to discharge your static electricity, in which that if you have an anti-static wristband, you can just use that. But but if you decide to not go with one. Then, then, then you also need to discharge static electricity anyway, which can be done by touching, um, which can be done by touching a conductive object that is grounded, such as such as if you plug your power supply into your case into the wall and you touch that, then you will have discharged your static electricity. And then you also need to find your workspace about where to assemble your PC. And the material of what the workspace is made is important. To prevent damage to your components, you want to avoid workspaces that are metallic or, or and prone to static electricity, 
such as carpet and metal. Now, now some good examples that I'll give that don't would be something like wood, plastic, and glass. Those are three surfaces which are not metallic or conductive and are not prone to building up static electricity. So the first step, we're going to insert the CPU and we're going to need the motherboard and the CPU along with it. So on the top, this is the space where we're going to install the CPU on the motherboard. And on, and on the below that, we have the CPUs themselves. So, so before in, installing the CPU, we need to be pay attention to how we handle the CPU. And in general, we should, we should never touch the bottom or top of the CPU or the point where it has all the pins or, or gold shiny points here. In which the, preferably, it's best if you hold the CPU side by side to prevent any damage. The same also goes for the motherboard socket in which that you shouldn't touch it directly in which that you should only touch it whenever you're, whenever you're installing the CPU to prevent damage to that as well. So once we know about that, then we can begin installing the CPU. Now, you may have noticed that, that, that now it's highlighted in red is that, is that all of these CPUs and the motherboard each have a distinct marking on one side or one corner. It's mostly a triangle, but it can also be a dot as well. And that represents which direction we need to put the CPU in. In which that this in which the marking on the CPU should align with the marking on the motherboard. So once we have that settled, then we can begin by unlocking the CPU slot or socket. Then to do this, you you need to raise a level in which this level is highlighted in blue in the example. On the other one, it's not really visible, but but to unlock the slot, we will need to raise that level. Once the level is raised, then you can begin installing your CPU in which that by grabbing just that, is that remembering to grab to handle the CPU with care by only grabbing it on its sides, then you can simply drop the CPU into the slot. The slot. And when I say drop, that doesn't mean to literally drop it. What it means is to just simply place it down gently into the slot and like wiggle and then wiggle it just a bit to make sure it's secure. Once that's done, then you can lower the, the level to lock it again. Then what's also important to mention is that a lot of times is that some motherboards will have a protective cover along the CPU sockets. For AMD motherboards, which are shown on the right, this doesn't always appear, and it does. And if it does appear, then you can just remove it at the beginning, and then and then save it for later. However, for Intel motherboards, which are shown shown on the left, the motherboard will almost always have a socket cover, in which that it's very important not to remove this until you are done installing the CPU. Now, once you've done inserting the CPU, then make then uh, the last tip is to remember to save that slot of, or the CPU cover that came with your motherboard. Your CPU, your, C your motherboard's manufacturer will not accept a warranty without that cover otherwise. So if you need to return it, you'll need, to, it's very important that you keep that cover. Next, we're going to install the CPU cooler. Now, the instructions are not really standardized in which that you'll have to refer to the manufacturer. But one thing that I can help you out with is the installation of thermal paste, in which the thermal paste is just simply a compound that, that helps transfer heat from the CPU to the cooler. Now, now a lot of times, CPU, CPU coolers have this already applied to the CPU cooler themselves in which they don't need to add it more. However, in case that you do need to add some more, then, then the way you apply it is to put one pea size drop in the thermal paste 
on the center of the CPU, and which in which the photo shown here is a good example. The next step is that we're going to still need our motherboard again, but we're going to install the RAM. So what's important before you start installing the RAM, what's important is that it's is that the slot where you install the RAM does matter. You'll need to consult your motherboard manufacturer as, as the slot can vary. But depending, but if you install a slot, if you install your memory incorrectly or in the slot where well, for example, if you have only have two sticks of RAM and there are four slots and you install it in the different slots your motherboard tells you to, you may end up in a situation where, you, where your motherboard is only recognizing one stick of RAM and we don't want that to happen. So once we have that settled, then, then we can begin installing the RAM by first pushing down the caps or like pushing away the caps highlighted in blue. Some other boards who have only will only have one cap that needs to be pushed down or can be pushed down, in which that case it's okay to push down just one cap. But if your motherboard has two caps that need to be pushed down, then you also need to push down both of them. Then next, once you have that done, then then you'll need to align the notch on the stick of RAM highlighted in red, along with the notch on the motherboard, which is also highlighted in red. Then once those are aligned, then you'll need to make sure to provide to provide firm and even pressure on on the stick of RAM. You may need some. You may need some. You definitely like needs some power in order for it to go in. But if but if you're pushing quite hard and it still isn't going in, then you may want to consider why isn't go why isn't it going in and maybe like double check well if your notches are aligned. Once it goes in, you'll hear an audible click and the, and the tabs that we talked about at the beginning highlighted in blue will automatically close. Next, we're going to install the storage if you have an NVMe SSD. And which here, it's best to install the NVMe SSD at this stage co compared to a tradition in which that if you have a traditional SSD or an HDD, we'll install it later. But for, but for an NVMe drive, you want to first locate where to install it on the motherboard as that location can vary. And then you'll want to insert the pins on the NVMe at a 30 degree angle compared to the connector as shown in this photo. Once, that's, once you've done that, then you'll need to push the end down to the motherboard. And while it's, and while it's being pushed down, then you'll want to secure it by screwing it in. Once you have that done, then you've installed your NVMe. Now, now we're done for the motherboard for now, but we'll also need to prepare the case. And, gen and generally this step can also vary, but the one major thing that you'll need to do almost always is to install the IO shield. And which the purpose of the IO shield is to simply prevent interference between between the outside of your case and your motherboard through 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 your input and output ports. Here, here your I/O shield will have to often have two labels, two sides, in which one where everything is labeled, such as the side such as the, the side that's shown in this picture, and a side that doesn't have that doesn't have anything. And you'll want the the side with that has all the markings facing outwards of the of the case. Then, then you also need to, then after you have that settled, then you also want to check to make sure that your IO shield will be, is also in the right orientation, in which a way you can do that is by, is by seeing where your motherboard would go in your case. And then from there, you can just visually imagine if your, if which way your IO is going to go facing your IO shield. Is that now once you have that so then you can just simply install it by putting it in a notch and making sure that every that all the sides is flush in which that the IO shield can be really tricky to install because it's can, because it's a tight fit. So you will really want to make sure that your IO shield is is snugly inside of the notch that your case has provided you. 
once you have that, then we can install the motherboard. And the motherboard and the motherboard will need to be installed in on top of these things called standoffs in the case, which are highlighted in red. And and now what you want to now this location will vary based off your case and motherboard. But once you've located that and you have it aligned, then you'll need to put, then you'll need to screw in your motherboard, as you can see in the standoff store are holes in there, which I made to fit screws in. So you can begin. So once you have it aligned, once your motherboard is aligned with those standoffs, then you can begin screw, screwing in your motherboard into the standoffs. And you need, and one important thing that you should mention is that you should not, over, is to be careful not to over tighten your screws as that can damage your motherboard. You'll want it to fit snugly to the point where you can't just like unloosen it by, by using your hand. But, but once you feel like a moderate amount of resistance and it's tight enough that you can move it in your hands, that's generally where you should stop. And once all your screws are put into place, then your motherboard is now officially in your case, along with all the other parts you installed before you put your motherboard in the case. Now we're going to install a power supply, and this is and your power supply will also come with a fan. And oftentimes you'll need to make a decision whether or not that fan should be facing the bottom of the case or the top. Now if your case includes ventilation at the bottom, which most cases do, oh, excuse me, then, then you want to put your fan facing the bottom, which is generally most cases. However, if there is no ventilation at the bottom, then you want to have your, your power supply facing the top of your case. And, and here, this is just an example, but, but, it's all, but securing the power supply can vary based off of each case. So that's something, again, that you're gonna to have to check the manual. But, but before you do that, you should attach all the cables you need before putting the power supply in the case. It can be very tricky sometimes to attach your cables to the power supply after it's already in the case. So to save that hassle, I would, rec I would recommend you considering how many cables you need and attach them before you install the power supply. Okay, so it appears that we're going to go over time. So I'm sorry about that. I'm going to be, I'm going to try to finish this up as quickly as I can. So next up, we're going to connect the front case connectors in which that the case has a number of buttons such as some IO and the power button. And you'll need to connect them to your motherboard on it's based off its designated markings. One thing that's very important and you'll see, and this will become a common trend is that the mother, is that the way in which I attach your front case connectors does matter, which that you'll see here that there are plus and minuses. If, if, you, if you accidentally attach it the wrong way, then it won't work. So that's something that you should pay close attention to. Next up is that we'll also need to give our case stands running and working by attaching it to the, to the motherboard. And it's and it's quite similar compared to the compared to attaching the front panel connectors from our case. Again, just make sure that you're installing it in the right direction and that you're attaching it to the right header. Now, now we're going to install a storage that is not an NVMe drive, in which that if you in which that most cases will have. A, a designated place about where you can mount your drives. Now the place, now that's, now the way you can mount your drives is also quite different based off each case. So again, you're gonna to have to check your manual. But once your drive is mounted, then you'll need to attach your power and data cables. Now, now the power, now you'll see that here, there are two things circled around here. And the red one is the power cable and the blue one is the data cable. So for your data cable, you'll want to first attach it from your hard drive to your motherboard and make, and you want to attach it using the native chipset. And, 
your motherboard will have will that will manual will often show which ports have are connected to the native chipset. But so and if you should and then if you can, you should always attach your drives to there simply because the native chipset is faster. If you have multiple drives and you don't have enough native chipset slots, then prioritize the faster drives like the SSDs. Then once you have that done, then you can attach the power, then you can attach the power cables, which if you which if you're at this stage, hopefully you listen to my advice and your power cable is already attached to your power supply. In which that case, it's really easy to just simply grab that and attach it to your disk. Next up, we're going to attach our power, some of our power supply connectors, which is the motherboard and the CPU. Now, it's now, it's now, this is again a situation where you just make sure everything is in the right direction and you plug each thing from the from the power supply into its designated in its designated spots. One important thing to mention about the CPU, however, and you can see it here, is that the CPU power supply connectors are actually split. Is and and it's only split on one end. So when so and you want to make sure that split end goes into the motherboard and the non-split end will go into the power supply. Now this step is optional and only applies if you have a dedicated video card. But if you do, then you'll need to install it as right here as well through the PCIe slots. And the PCIe slots are located just under your CPU most of the time. Now, just like with installing the RAM, the slot does matter. You should generally install it to the closest space near the CPU and make sure it is an X16 slot or any slot that your video card supports. Because, because generally, that this is the slot that will be the fastest. Now, the process is very similar to installing RAM. However, one thing that we will need to do is that you can see on the left side that there are a bunch of caged metal separated by solid metal. And those, and those are the PCIe slots. And we'll, and we'll need to remove them in order for our graphics card or video card to fit. And most graphics cards will take up two slots. So what we need to do is that we'll need to remove the slot that's parallel to the PCIe slot, and then remove the one to the bottom of that, which will be up. Which once we have that done, then it's just going to look like a gap in your in your case, which will be filled by the video card. Once and once you have that done, then then. Then there will be like a same tab similar to the one in the RAM in which that you need to unlock that, and again pay attention to the notch which is highlighted in blue, which your graphics card will also have a notch that aligns with the with the one on the motherboard. And then once and then and then then you can just simply apply foam pressure, just like when you install the RAM, and once it's installed, it will click audibly and the tab close, just like the RAM. Once that's done, then you can connect your power supply to your mother, to your video card. Now, now, now at this point, our PC can technically be running if, if, there, if no issues arose, but we still need to manage our cables. And this and this is important because we obviously want we don't want our cables to be like dangling and like touching our PC components. And so this is where that belt those velcro strips come in, in which that we can simply reroute each cable as neatly as possible and then group them together in order to prevent loose stray cables. Now, obviously, you want to avoid doing stuff like blocking the fan, which can in, which can negatively impact your computer. But once you have that done, this isn't something that is that if you're not too concerned about appearance, then you can just even shove it in like a free space, like maybe near your power supply. Uh, like like this is a good example where all the cables are near the power supply, and just simply group together, leading to the power, leading to each point. 
So at this point, our if if we didn't have any issues, our PC would be can can actually turn on now. But there's still some other stuff we need to do. So one main important thing that we should mention is that our computer does not have an OS yet. So to install an OS, we'll need to configure the BIOS. So so the first so the way we can configure the BIOS is by we'll mainly need to, we're mainly concerned with the function called boot priority. And boot priority refers to uh, with basically controls how which which PC or which device will boot up first. And if and you'll want your installation media to be at the very top of that list. So here, this is an example where there are multiple disks already installed, but in your new computer, there wouldn't be any disk installed and, and you'll have to attach like maybe a flash drive to your computer, which has your OS in it. Then you'll need to drag that to the top to ensure that, that your PC will boot from that first instead of defaulting to going into the BIOS settings page. Some other things that you can do in the BIOS is to update your BIOS, which can be necessary if, if, you, if your P CPU needs it. For example, some certain CPUs will require a BIOS update for it to work. And, you'll, and, and you may sometimes need to set the RAM speed, for example. A, RAM, a stick of RAM labeled 3200 megahertz May only run at a may run at a slower speed out of the box, so that's something you'll need to configure manually. However, I recommend doing that after you have used your PC for a while to make sure that the RAM is working in the first place. So once you have that all set up, then you can install the OS in which that once that you can just restart your computer, and then it will boot up for your installation guide, and then you can just go from there as. So now you've installed your OS. Now, but the last thing that I will need to do is to install our drivers. If you're using Windows, most of the, a lot of drivers may be already installed for you, but some drivers like the video card and the motherboard, will, you will have to install yourself. The way you can do that is that by going to the manufacturer's page and then searching up the product that you need drivers for. It. Then you can just simply Run and then you'll get an executable file that you can run, and that will automatically install your drivers for you. And and once you have your drivers installed, then your hardware should be able to work. So at this point, if nothing went wrong, then congratulations, you have just built your your custom PC. But that's sometimes, but unfortunately, that's not always the case. So let's just say, okay, help in case like maybe after you've installed everything, then your PC doesn't turn on. So your first means your in instinct may be to return parts, but returning parts should almost always be done as a last resort and only if, if the part is truly defective. So you'll need to check to make sure that all connections are snug and all parts are in good condition. For example, did you accidentally attach a header the wrong way or, or maybe you didn't, or maybe you accidentally installed the CPU the wrong way, which will also make it not work. And, and oftentimes is that generally the main troubleshooting tips I would give you is to only make sure to do one thing at a time to make sure that you can closely monitor what effect has on what, which will help you to deduce what's actually going on in your computer and which part is at fault. Another thing is that your search engine is also very useful is that oftentimes, even though I don't have the time to explain every single problem in detail, if searching up your, if you search up your, your problem, then you can find a lot of other people that may have had the same problem and see solutions for that as well and see how other people solved it is also very helpful. And lastly, something that, that's also very helpful and comes on, mo on some modern motherboards is called a Q code that indicates the status of the computer. And this, is, and this is very useful because it can tell us what state the computer's in and where there are any issues. 
for example, if the Q code is displaced by five in this case, which on this motherboard in which the Q codes aren't necessarily universal across all motherboards, then we would know that there's an issue with the memory and that our memory is not installed. So instead of having to troubleshoot and just see where the problem is first, it can directly go to the memory and focus on that. Now, lastly, some basic maintenance. If if well, I assume most of you have school computers, so this is just going to be basic review. But in general, you should take care of your P of your custom PC just like as you would take care of any other PC, such as things like make sure you keep the area around your PC clean, put your PC into sleep when not using it at, to not waste any electricity, and 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 also make sure to keep it in a well ventilated area. And to make sure that there was also that you're not blocking any like ventilation points. And then you also have like the general stuff on the software side as well, in which you have to be careful what you download and make sure not to fill up. For example, something that's also important to mention is that if you say so if your SSD is more than 75% full, then you may see some slowdowns in performance as well. However, this However, I'm not going to spend too much time going over this since, since I assume a lot of you have already used a computer before and you should just take care of your custom PC in the exact same way you are taking care of your previous computer. So here are some resources. Again, I'll, I'll, I'm going to apologize again for going over time. If, if you need to go now, then you can just go now. I'm, but here are some resources in case you are one, wondering if you have any more information and also how I got all this information in the first place, here we have some YouTube channels, which is which provide a lot of good information about how to build your PC. And also, I also use these channels as a reference a lot of times. And then we also have PC Port Picker as well, which is the website I recommend when choosing your ports. And then lastly, I've attached a short YouTube video that explains in detail all the ways you can make sure your PC is compatible. Now, I would like to give a big thanks to my parents who helped me a lot on this slide. And now we're going to go into the Q&A session in which I would like to thank you all again for staying until the very end. And if you have any questions, you are free to ask them now. In which that if you don't have any questions now, then you're also free to leave or if you on as well, so. All right, so it doesn't seem like we have any questions at all. So I'm so again, I would like to thank you all for coming and you guys are all free to leave if, if you do not have any further questions you would like to ask.